Welcome to the Chimera Open Mic, where you have the great opportunity to listen to up-and-coming authors. Our first reader is Matthew Keeley. Matthew is a teacher and writer of novels, short stories and arts reviews. His sci-fi debut, Turning the Hourglass, was published in 2019, and he is a winner of the National Trust Scotland Morton Writing Competition. He lives in Glasgow, surrounded by cats and rescue hens. For the open mic, he is reading a piece called The Stone in My Pocket. Hello, I'm Matthew Keeley, and this is chapter one from my novel, The Stone in My Pocket. August 1999. At first, I thought it was the cat. Sometimes Freya would be out there in the garden at night, yowling to come in or chattering at birds she couldn't catch. Or if it wasn't her, maybe a fox. I'd heard them howling like babies in the dark a few times. Then it wailed again. No, not a wail. Duller than that. A moan. That's when sickness lurched in my stomach. The same kind of plummet when you realise you've been caught lying again or your parents ask you a question you don't want to answer. I knew the noise wasn't Freya or a fox or any animal. It was coming from a person. A voice. I wouldn't have heard it if my bedroom window hadn't been open. I only did that in summer. The TV that I wasn't supposed to be watching this late was already turned down low, but I clicked the mute button, amplifying the groaning voice seeping into the room. Then I turned the lamp off to get rid of my gormless reflection in the window and let me see out there. But the blue-white light from the TV still danced against the walls and glowed in the glass. The voice snuffled to a stop. They, whoever they were, must have spotted the lamp turning off, must have seen me. The bushy edge of a moonlit conifer shuffled in a sudden breeze, and I pictured a man out there, someone drunk or homeless, hiding in the dark, trying to break in and rob us. I've no idea why I thought of that. Weird what fear conjures. I crouched by the open window. The voice was there again, gulping in juddered breaths like something wounded. Clouds drifted, and the moon bathed the garden in grey-blue sheen. But it was empty. No cat roaming under the bushes, no fox rummaging in the wheelie bin. The old rusted swing chains weren't even squeaking in the wind. But I still felt eyes prodding at me from some secret place. I'd learned the sensation years ago. Shivering, I swallowed and poked my head out into the air that now felt too cold for August. I peered down to see if someone was standing right beneath me, pressed against the wall. But there was nothing except blank concrete slabs. And the moaning had stopped. I ducked back in and yanked the window closed like I'd just flung a spider from a glass. Most other people might have shouted for their parents or rushed to the room to tell them, but there was no point telling my mum and dad. They wouldn't believe me. I'd stopped listening to my nonsense years ago. Back to bed, Nathan, it'd be. They'd tell me the noise was only Freya or maybe something a little more cliched about it being the wind or the old houses just creaked at night. That's usually a stupid explanation for things like this in books and films. I turned to the muted TV to see Mulder and Scully scarper with torches around a dark building chasing some black creature. Not helping. My mum had caught me in the middle of an episode one night last year and banned it. It'll cause more nightmares, Nathan. What other 17-year-old still had their parents telling them what they weren't allowed to watch? I switched the TV off and clambered onto the bed, feeling like poison was swelling in my guts. Every few seconds I turned to the window thinking I could hear it again, but the voice was just an echo in my head by then. I never can sleep early on a Sunday night, especially not before the start of a new school term, but now the idea of tucking myself into bed and drifting off was a joke. I pulled my knees towards my chin and checked my watch. Almost midnight. I flicked the switch on my lamp and lifted the book from the bedside table, pulling my bookmark out from the middle of Mysteries Unsolved, Beasts and Aliens. I'd had most of the Mysteries Unsolved series for years, but I only used to look at the pictures and read the captions under the weirdest ones. I glanced down at a page with a printed photograph of a blurry, dark human shape between tree trunks. Was that what was out there, calling for me to listen? I looked to the window, then closed the book again, shoving it back to the table. My mum had probably been right about the nightmares. It had been months since she'd shaken me awake in darkness. I didn't want that to start again. My final plan was to scuttle to the chair at my desk and turn on the little spotlight lamp above my model, the Empire State Building. Finishing the silver paint on the needle helped me forget what I'd heard, for a while at least. 
The last time I remembered seeing in the clock was 2.58. I woke myself up, my feet squirming like thrashing fish outside the rumpled covers. I didn't remember climbing into bed or turning the lights out and I'd fallen asleep on my back, which I never did. When I pushed myself up onto my forearms, I saw it. Her. Him. The shadowed figure standing in my doorway. Next, we welcome Sandy Morrison. Sandy was for many years a lab rat in industrial R&D. Later, he worked as a technical editor on a range of business publications. Now retired, he plans to move to writing science fiction and on environmental and space topics. He is reading a short piece entitled At the Station. This is an extract from my short story At the Station, where I have imagined many different species working and interacting together. Finding an unoccupied area in what she called Central Park, Aspie casually slung a light blanket on the springy turf and threw herself down on it. The nan of her sat down uneasily with her eyes downcast. Hey, take it easy, sis. You don't have to sit like that. Sorry, that green sky and the low gravity are making me dizzy. Maybe I'll be able to face looking up in a bit. Asby laughed. OK, it confused me a bit at first, but you get used to it. Talking of robots as we were a moment ago, the nan of her said. What are those three doing here? Oh, they're not robots. Catalahi, methane breathers. It's hard enough to keep this ecosystem stable with 20-odd species coming and going all the time, but some just can't fit in. They live through the other side of that bulkhead, but I guess now and again some feel they just need to see more space and species and you find them wandering here in atmosphere suits, poor creatures. But, by the way, I haven't seen you for so many years. How long are you going to stay here? I book my flight back on the next ship home in about ten days. If I cancel, I'll have to find a job here, won't I? As we flicked her ears. No problem. Station hates to turn anyone away. It's easy enough to find work for anything with two legs and some arms. A bit more difficult for some of the avians in other shapes. I meant to ask you that. Just what does the avian on your team do? Aitzel's our safety officer. You may need a sharp eye, a good memory and a suspicious mind. She's certainly got all three of those. Aspie felt a sudden gust of wind behind her. Thank you for the compliment, if it was one. The huge grey bird settled down beside them while Aspie tried to hide her face in embarrassment. Ah, it's good to be able to stretch my wings again. Can't beat a good glide and low G for relaxation too. How'd you like our little island of civilization, then, Anima? Takes a bit of getting used to, but I'm sure you'll settle in. Beats living on a natural world any day. See you this evening. She lifted off clumsily and was instantly transformed into a gracefully soaring silhouette. The nan of her suddenly recalled something her half-sister had completely failed to comment on. Have you been keeping up with the news from home? she asked. As we flicked her ears again, only the family updates. This is my world now. Back home doesn't seem so important when you mix with people from a couple of dozen other systems. The nan of her stared at her in shock. The biggest crisis we've had in centuries and you know nothing about it. We only just avoided a civil war. It's the worst incident since the Veltran earthquakes made a hundred million homeless. Mind you, there's only a couple of thousand permanently dead this time, she added acidly. Asby's blank look confirmed the nan of her suspicions that her nearest and once dearest had indeed lost touch with her home world. <clears throat> she glared angrily. Maybe I better tell you then. It'll be quicker than trying to persuade you to watch the vids. Archaeologists were drilling down into the Antarctic ice. They hit volcanic ash at the 80,000 year level. Under the ash, the robot moles found a complete village. It looked like it had been very isolated. They recovered enough DNA to clone almost half the villagers. Oh, that's really interesting, cut in Asby in a bored tone that implied that so far as she was concerned, it was nothing of the sort. The nan of us stared at her, horrified. Don't you understand, she shouted. 80,000 years back. Completely isolated. When did our males go extinct? Finally she got some reaction. Oh, about... No. You're not telling me they're going to clone males, are you? They can't. Think what that would do to our clan and family structures. She tailed off into silence and her ears drooped as Lenanima's expression told her that had been exactly what was planned. Oh, yes. Like good scientists, the archaeobiologists wanted to clone all the villagers they could and to hell with any consequences. There were riots from people who could see all the likely problems and invented a hundred unlikely ones, but everyone from evolutionary historians to the prehistory reenactment societies thought this was an unbelievable opportunity. 
I don't know why I should suddenly be so concerned, she added sarcastically. Most of the Fed species seem to cope with having two sexes. We can only survive because of that weird quirk of biology I brought in my luggage. Anyway, eventually they managed to negotiate a solution that left only a few hundred people raging. What are they going to do then? All the villagers will be cloned and more created by gene mixing. They'll live in a sealed section of a habitat that's just being finished off, along with any prehistory buffs who want to find out what life was really like with males. That calmed nearly everyone down. Only the people who'd booked themselves a new life on the habitat are annoyed. The government can pretty much shuffle priorities and buy them off. Expensive, but safe. Our next reader is Lida Morehouse. Lida leads a double life. By day, she's a shameless award-winning science fiction author. By night, she dons her secret identity as Tate Hallowell, best-selling paranormal romance author. She is reading from her most recent romance, Unjust Cause, published by Wizard Tower Press in April 2020. I poked Valentine in the chest. Valentine, we need to talk. The last few nights had been typical of South Dakota in the summer, hot and muggy, so I hadn't worn much to bed. I was tucked under a thin sheet in nothing more than a pair of Val's cast off cotton block boxers. The open window let in a meager breeze that smelled faintly of the dusty scent of wheat. Valentine cracked open an eye to look at me. Within, when in human form, he was devastatingly handsome, at least to me. I guess other people saw him differently. Where my gaze lingered on regal, strong features, others found the sharp lines of his face full of cold, calculating menace. I'd call his gray eyes smoldering, but they used words like penetrating, intense, and predatory. I was pretty sure we'd all agree, though, that he was long and lean and had wonderfully hard pale skin, a color reminiscent of moonlight, and a deep and deep midnight black hair. At the moment, however, I could sort of understand where other people got their impressions. Silken hair disheveled by sleep hid most of his face, except for a singular icy gray eye that stared up at me unblinking like a lizard's. A growly and deep voice snarled, talk? What topic of conversation could possibly be worth disturbing my slumber? You know that thing about sleeping dragons? Anyway, I ignored the menace in his tone. Do you see anything wrong with me? You're awake. After a moment, he added coolly, and talking. Exactly, I agreed. Do you know why I'm awake? I could tell by the way his lips pressed together. He held back a lot of responses that probably began because you live to irritate me or something similar. Instead, he finally blinked and sighed. Perhaps you'll enlighten me. Sitting up, I showed him the problem. All over my chest, stuck by sweat, were coins. There was a quarter on my shoulder. A dime wedged itself into the hollow between my breasts. Pennies covered my arms. Something large like a Mexican peso or a half dollar poked the inside of my thigh. Peeling a nickel off my neck, I held it out to him. What is all this? He snatched the nickel from my hand and shoved it under his pillow. Mine, he said simply. He flopped over onto his other side, turning his back to me like the conversation was over. I sleep better with it. Well, I don't, I said, pulling the coins off from my body and dropping them onto his head one by one. My reign of change didn't even make him flinch. In fact, if anything, the soft sound of the coins clinging together lulled him back to sleep. I nudged him again. Seriously, Val, you have got a hoarding problem. Hmm, problem, you say, he murmured happily. Long bone fingers picked up a few of the coins from his pillow. He turned them over in his fingers for a moment, doing that thing magicians do, rolling them somehow along his hand. Lifting his massive frame, he turned around to face me. The bed creaked with the shift of his weight. That alien gaze of his captured my own. Then he took a quarter from his finger and licked it. <laughs> the way his tongue caressed the metal was sinful. I was utterly mesmerized. After he finished molesting the money, he stuck it to my arm. Then he violated another one with that long, wicked tongue of his, a penny this time, and pressed it to my stomach. He smiled lazily at me. Crooking his finger, he coaxed me down. Reaching up, he cupped the back of my neck with his hand, pulling me close, my ear to his lips. Valentine's deep voice rumbled against my eardrum, 
and sent shockwaves of pleasure deep inside me. You're my greatest treasure, Alexander Connor. Let me lie, let me lie atop of you. Oh, yes. I kissed him. At first his lips were cool and unyielding, but then he opened to my teasing pressure. My mouth parted hungrily, but Valentine would not be rushed. Maybe it was a cold-blooded dragon thing, but morning sex always began torturously slow. Not that I was complaining. As he moved to roll us over, I let myself marvel at the cleverness of his tongue as it finally slid into my mouth, teasing lips and teeth and sending more shivers along my arching back. In a moment, I forgot everything, even the, ignore and the annoying sensation of coins sticking to our hot, sweaty skin. An hour later, a small fortune clattered to the floor as I left the trail, a trail of pennies all the way to the shower. Next, a big camera welcome to B. Ray Gross. B. Ray Gross is a Pittsburgh-born writer and storyteller. She is reading her flash fiction piece, The Ghost Walk. The first time you see her, you will hardly see her at all. You will not be there to see her. You will not stay long enough to look long enough. You will be passing the field as you have passed it before, a field of tall grass and taller, pale, bluish-purple wildflowers. It will be early in the morning, comfortably cool, and you will pass by, and after you have passed by, you will remember only, and only vaguely, that the sun was shining on the mist that hung over the field, and that the wildflowers are the same color as her dress. The second time you see her, you will have the feeling that you've seen her before, though you won't remember when, Again, you will only be passing by, and only get a glimpse as she walks through the field, through the mist that's always there on early summer mornings. After this, you'll remember easily that the bluish-purple flowers are the same color as her dress, and that her hair is like the pale sunlight. You won't be able to remember whether or not she was walking alone. You will hate not remembering whether or not she was alone. You will wake earlier than usual the next morning and go to the field, you will wish that you knew the names of the flowers growing there, and it might be then that you see her again, or it might not be until you've walked through the field, morning after morning after morning. But one morning you will be walking through the field, and you will fall. This will be the third time you see her, when you are on the ground, surrounded by tall grass and taller wildflowers. You will see the hem of her pale, bluish-purple dress. You will look up, she will hold out her hand to you, smiling warmly. You will let her help you up, and when she lets go of your hand and turns away from you, you will follow her, and keep following her. If you follow her long enough, maybe someday someone will see you walking there too. Our final open mic reader is Joyce Maggot. Joyce is a writer and librarian living in Chicago and longing to return to Scotland, where it appears she left a large portion of her heart. She is reading a story called One More Chance, or Why I Brought Back the Dodos. Enjoy. One More Chance, or Why I Brought Back the Dodo. Everyone knows the children's book with the iconic drawing, the portly gentleman in French cuffs and soft cravat, his robust features and strangely bulbous head, the comic giveaway. They've gone in and out of fashion a dozen times, brave characters whose artless wisdom we're meant to take to heart once we finally finished laughing. We had an artifact of theirs at home, a child-sized chair with figures cut in low relief. Carved all across the front, a stern procession marched, but turned the thing around and joyous figures in their hundreds danced and played. I always wondered why it wasn't mine. I planned to visit them when I grew up, and then, like you, I learned they were all gone. Our forebears meant no harm, our teachers said, but resources were limited, and one has one's own interests to look out for, after all. I harbored grief and shame about their loss for years. They'd been right here, the Dodonean people. The celebrated drawing hurt my heart. I studied chemistry, the least romantic field I could imagine, and made self-replicating spider silk, and thus my fortune. As strong as diamonds, if more tractable, and speculation about my processes abounded. One day, as I amused myself with the latest crop of foolish guesses, my eye fell on some news about the dodo. Their genes contained some DNA from us. What happiness was this? Imagine it. There were a few of us who joined with them before it was too late, and they all lived in harmony together, 
beneath the wheeling sun. That was me leaping to the wrong conclusion. The article went on to say no bodies of our ancestors were ever found among the dodo graves. Our genes had joined with theirs because we raped them. You could have known this too if you'd happened upon certain pages in the popular press on a day or two in August, some 30 years ago. It was their trusting nature did them in, of course. Anyone else could have predicted what would happen as soon as we turned up. I tracked down the original study and after that its author, badgered her until she showed me her research, rained money on her pet projects till she agreed to clone them. Then came the years of trial and error, dashed hopes and tragic losses. By the time we had our great success, I'd learned everything there was to know about their history, beliefs, behavior. I acquired the six surviving infants and I spun them a whole world and broadcast their lives on special programs yearly. I'd like to think my storytelling skills improved as time went on. The first release was practically raw footage. I excised the parts where I was sobbing and ended with triumphant shots of sturdy babies. The viewership expanded every year. Only now, you know you weren't watching actors. The entertainment pages breathless coverage of the children returning to the set for a few weeks every summer pure nonsense that I wove for you with care. I kept them on that vast soundstage year round. No other life besides the one I gave them. No school but my instruction. No food apart from the wholesome stuff that was their birthright. I taught their games to them and held their ceremonies. Gave them the finest artifacts I could acquire and those I couldn't buy had reproduced. I was pleased my family's artifact, the little chair with the marching figures, had been so well preserved. Since I could trust no one with my great secret, I'd switched round day with night from the beginning. While they slept, I took my place in the business world again. I knew they sometimes left the house at night, their night, I mean. I'd set up cameras everywhere, as you'd expect. I saw no reason to acknowledge or prevent these small excursions. Beyond the house was nothing that could harm them, only fields and woodland they knew well. The soundstage, as I said, was vast. Of late, I'd barely glanced at the new footage. Between instructing them all night, my night, and fending off the latest business crisis, even my reserves of energy were wearing thin. By now, they were 12 years of age and muscular. It took a lot of exercise to wear them out. As for my work, I spent my days ensuring no one else made cheaper spider silk. I should have guessed the distance they could cover and still be back in bed when I returned. I never thought they would deceive me. I hadn't even conducted their coming of age ritual yet. They must have tried a hundred times before they found it, slipping out to march until the hardened air, the best matte landscapes I could buy, prevented them from going any further, then feeling for the door that must be there, the door through to the other side, where joyful crowds would surely be awaiting them. It's always been their trusting nature does them in. But let's consider this a lesson learned. Next time, I'm going to do it right if you'll permit me. You wait and see.